and welcome to the third talk of the Frontline Club series, Looking at the Still Image. We'll be broadcasting this program the first Thursday of every month. Please nip into the Frontline website to view all their events that Pambira has organized. The Frontline Club, without question, is my favorite watering hole in London. Provocative events and brilliant cuisine in their restaurant. The series features the influence and the impact of the still photograph. And for me, on a very personal basis, the still captures a moment in time, allowing the viewer to really slow down. It allows for contemplation. Today's theme is the influence of ethnic diversity and photography. What are the challenges in this way to black and ethnic diversity in the 21st century? I've been on a massively steep learning curve working with our exceptionally knowledgeable panelists to create this topical and provocative talk. They have introduced me to some stunning artists I was totally unaware of, and I thought I knew quite a lot. That along with the historical significance over the years since the earliest days of photography. Best has been over this time that we've been pulling together this talk is the chatter we've all had on Zoom. We've become friends and it's great and sharing of ideas and discussing the nuances of diversity, the images, historical significance. I'd like to now introduce the panelists and we're going to start with Jermaine Francis, a London-based photographer who works in documentary and portraiture in the format of personal driven photo projects and editorials. He has often turned his lens on London for ID photo photographing the homeless crisis, activist fighting for change, and recently the empty streets during the pandemic. The city's first lockdown is now the subject of photography book. Something that was so familiar becomes distant. And don't we all know that, Jermaine? Absolutely, positively. <laughs> and following on that, Song Chang, a New York City-based curator, professor of photography and theory at New York University and the New School, a guest lecturer at Fordham University and trustee with the Martin Parr Foundation, a former director of the Milk Gallery. Her research interests of post-colonial visual culture and the epistemologies of memory. Uh, Jermaine, can you kick off the talk? Sure, thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about a few photographers, um, a few example of photographers uh, who work, uh, who, who I think have contributed to photography in the area. And I think they've attempted to create a rich and sophisticated work which, which deal with these complex issues, race, gender, identity, and, and representation, especially in an everyday normalized space. Um, and the conversation I'm trying to do is, is working with the everyday and this thing of negotiating the space, whether it's physical or psychological at play. I mean, uh, a lot of the, I think the approach that I'm taking is kind of influenced by sort of the writings of uh, Henri Lefebvre, you know, critiques of the everyday life. Um, you know, he looked at the space as gendered and, and something that isn't neutral in the everyday or and Stuart Hall's theory of representation. And also a reference to sort of say Mark Seeley's decolonizing the camera. Um, so a lot of what I'm looking at is sort of referenced or influenced by some of those kind of writings. And the first four that I've picked uh, of photographers, first three or four, are part of a group who I think have made a massive contribution to this country uh, and, and in photography in general. And, you know, they're all part of the founding associations of Autograph, ABP, which was the originally association of black photographers. Um, and I think, you know, that they also reflect the ethos and the, the importance of that institution for practitioners of colour um, and the whole discourse of, of critical practice in photography in this country. And the first person I'd like to sort of work with on, on looking at in the actual um, imagery is Neil Kenlock. I'm going to look at, and um, I can't I'll just see if I can see the PDF here. Um, not sure I can see that just here. Here we go. Yes, Neil Kenlock, um, who, was, who was born in Jamaica and along with uh, Ahmet Francis, Vanley Burke and, and other photographers, who, they, they documented the British black experience. Um, and, and they really tried to, try to basically move away and, and, and try and show the alternative that was in mass media of, of, of negative imagery and one dimensional imagery 
of, of, of the black community. Um, and they really challenged those, those views, trying to break what was trying to reinforce those ideological positions um, to, towards the black community. As, as Mark Seeley suggests with Ken Locke and Francis and Burke, they were, they were constantly trying to show this everyday normalized situations of, of, of black people. Um, and, you know, in, in the 70s, just to give the top context of what was going on, you know, as Stuart all pointed out, it was this, this negative imagery of young black loops as, as crime was increasing and there was this hysteria in, in the population, um, mainly in, in the mass media towards the white population of a crime that was attributed to black youth. And, and I kind of understand a lot of that from the sort of 80s and 90s, the same thing. Um, and why I've picked these particular images by Ken Lock, um, I think a lot of people are used to seeing a lot of the images out on the street and the documents is, it, it's removed ourselves from that outside space into the intimate interior space, which is the living room. And I think that's really interesting, you know, this normalized everyday space. I mean, the actual purpose of these images actually were to be made, to be sent home to the relatives in the Caribbean. Uh, it's like a sort of articulating, um, you know, showcasing material goods and, and modern housing as this sort of like talking that they have successfully sort of uh, settled in Britain in, in, the, in, the, in this new land and that they were doing well. And I, and I think what they do is show a very different imagery and representation from what you would have been used to at that point in time you know i think there's a that they're sophisticated and modern and people are proud you know that they, they and, you know they, they show you know a lot of people are they're very proud of of of, of all their, their materials and, and domestic situations and a, and a sort of normal life um and, and, it, and it's it shows an equality with their their neighbours, their white neighbours. I think we flipped to Sunnils there. I think we need to flip back quickly. Yeah, that's it, sorry. Um, yeah, so, you know, we've. what was really interesting about this is where I could remember my own parents when they had become successful, improved their lives and, you know, they had no improvements. There was a sort of strange mixture of envy and bewilderment from the sort of the white neighbours, how it, how, it, how it could be done because, there'd been so much of this negative imagery that had been saying that, you know, black people, it was just negative, it was crime, that, you know, there, there weren't hardly any positive images of black people just doing stop jobs. It. Stop it there for a second, Jimmy. You know, when I first viewed the imagery, the thing that it, it stuck in my mind, of course, you know, we're in a particular era, but we can tell by the television and all the rest, is very mm. much what you said and I think we can add a layer on top of that which is that it's just an average family black yeah. white or purple that is middle class has certain accoutrements like a television they've got a nice home and there's a comfort zone there's no poverty there at all you, you're seeing something that it's quite comfortable and 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 and, and I, I think portraying that you know, it, it, you, you say they're very average, but I also say it, it was a veneer of what was middle class in the time. Would you, well, would you... I would say maybe, I would say no. Um, a lot of these people were still working class um, in, in, in their persona, in, <laughs> in, in, their, in, in the persona, a lot of these were probably working class, but, but middle class, but I understand. <laughs> We have, let me just finish, you know, the last time we just talked about it, <laughs> I come from America, working yeah. class is anyone that works, and, and they have, you know, an income that's average and, and so on, whether he's yeah. a plumber or she's a, a cleaner, at the end of the day, uh, you know, they, they, they have, they're living a, 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 what I call a middle class mid income life that they can afford to do certain things and so on. But it's very important, yeah, but it's very important to stipulate in this country, those class distinctions are also part of the demonization factor. So in this country where the economics are, and you know, it's also class is based on sort of not just economics, it's based on breed, it's based on um, also very different social moral codes. So working classes get, become demonized even though they probably, you know, they have a nice house or whatever material goods, but it's about the morals 
that are also placed in those kind of different class groups. But it's in a sense of having, you know, basically what, what, we, what which I know what you're talking about, you know, they're people who are working hard, they're, 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 they're basically having very normal, everyday lives. And basically what we're talking about is humanity, you know, and, and what he's showing is it's humanized. Okay, let, let's move on. Vision. No, but what, the only reason I'm saying that is because it, it does, it, it is really important to also talk about the class distinctions in this country in a way that, um, the way that representation is made. And that was also used in the representation of black people to some extent. But I mean, the other thing that's really good as well, which I think is important about these images is from a photographic aspect is, you know, cannot working in color. You know, you know, as you as you know, but black and white was always seemed as the sort of it, it held a pursuit of signifying something more pure or documentary in the realms of art, and, and Kenlock's actually working in colour here, and also just the composition and, and the craft of like studio portrait images of people in their everyday normal lives, and I think they're really beautiful, fantastic images because they, I think they're very sophisticated and there's a there's a real sort of dignity to them and also a kind of matter of fact normality which I think is really beautiful like you're seeing all the, the elements of the interior there and it's sort of not perfect but there's something kind of beautiful about the mundane which you can talk about things like Eggleston you know making talk photographing the everyday the mundane in colour and, and other photographers like that so I think that's really interesting with Ken Locke's work here and these why I've gravitated these two particular images in, in, in general, or this, this group of work. And so the next person I want to talk about is Sunil Gupta's work, which is pretended family relationships, which, you know, I think is a really sort of radical approach to documenting sort of um, the doc documentary work. I, it's interesting with these next group of photographers who come along because um, there, was, there was these ruptures in, in photography going on and the, there was you know I remember coming in at university before there was a rupture from Sekula and Rossler questioning what the document can be Martha Rossler and Alan Sekula and then Victor Bergen came along and you know the Royal College the, the RCA group and, and people questioning again what the image is and there was this real sort of critical practice and then there was another rupture which was sort of black photography and, and, and critical practice again and I think from these ruptures and, and dealing with representation and agency and all these other subjects came a real sort of radical approach to strategy and I, I think what's great about these works you know at the time you know Thatcher's basically builds section 28 which was was, was basically s suggesting or saying that um you know, homosexuality was something that was amoral and it was erosion of the fabric of society and everything else, the it was like a lifestyle choice and it became weaponized in political act. What's brilliant about Sonil's work is in this sense, he's, he, you know, pretended family relationships, what he, but he's, he's showing, we, you know, homosexual, queer couples, whatever you want to define it as, are having normal, so-called normal relationships. They are real relationships. And I, I really enjoy the way that Sunil makes these images here in very, very sort of nor what would be like in sort of very mundane, normal, everyday situations of couples together. But then what was really interesting, there were a montage of images and writing by his partner, Stephen Todd, poems. And then what you have is the, the, the images of sort of protests and activist images. And it, it works in two ways. It's, it, it's, it's a portrait that basically you can see in what would be so-called in conservative Thatcher terms, a, a normal heterosexual nuclear family sort of images in, in, their, in, in the home or domestic spaces. And then Sonno is also talking about, but this is what is actually, going on as well has to be dealt with this constant attack or, 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 or constant protest and fight to have a lifestyle have, a, have this life and be able to live in, in Britain in that time you know suggesting his family unit there's a, a couple of images along I think maybe which is really interesting or it might be the next image if we could go to the next image along 
from this one. This image is really interesting because you have this, you know, Sonil, you know, in some ways it'd be naive to think, but there wasn't a suggestion of some kind of dual play here. You have this Asian man walking along here who we would read in the situation from the images as probably being queer. Then you have an Asian police officer. You know, there is there's a suggestion at times if you want to make a play of the story, is there a conversation about basically, are these two men the same? Are they different? Is a reference point to maybe, you know, homosexuality in institutions or non-acceptance of homosexuality in institutions? Is, is it also talking about, you know, pe people from, you know, the same background, the same colour and, you know, not an acceptance of that within the community? You know, unfortunately, in, you know, I know in the black community, homosexuality, there's a lot of homophobia within the, within the community as well. And that actually fed into Thatcher's Section 28. So they agreed with the moral point of view. So it's it's interesting to see the see see this imagery work together. I think there's a lot of layers in there. I think there's a, an image with Isaac Julian. I think maybe two slides along, if we can see that. Um, and then you know what's really interesting is the image here on the right hand side in black and white. Also, you know, two two men standing there, and there's a child. In the, in, in the pram, you know, and it's talking about like real sort of relationships, real families, real family units. And, you know, this was under, you know, a real hostile context of Section 28. Also, we had AIDS going on, HIV, which was being classed as basically a queer plague, you know, even though it, it crossed all borders of sexuality. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, different layers going on here and I think it's a really important yeah, piece of work. Uh, the, uh, the colour image, I mean the whole thing because it's a, a montage. When, what, what I think, oh gosh I can't remember exactly, so I forgot, I do, I've written, rough, done it. Late 80s it would have been this the reason, work. The reason I ask it, I'm, I, I'm looking at, at the imagery uh, and if you just, you don't even need to blur your eyes. For me, the image could be made today because yeah the fashion uh, uh, look uh, 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 and maybe you know it's the evolution of of, uh, of the um, white uh, 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 person wearing a, a which is you know a, it probably was less fashionable in the 1980s but you know he's wearing a white t-shirt with a kind of a jacket you know quasi formal jacket the rolled up jeans the whole look of it for me can be shot today it, it, it has the same you know, the, from a fashion perspective, and the message is very powerful. You know, you see a, 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 a mixed couple, you, you, you make an assumption, at least I would make an assumption from, mm -hmm. from the way they stand, that, that they are uh, 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 in a relationship and that they are gay. That, that, that's the, the, me, just observational and, and so on. And, and it's an elegant picture. I mean, this picture is really, Absolutely, go I think it's gorgeous. I, I, I love it. To, I love it to bits. And but it, it had the reason I asked you the dating on it is that it mm -hmm. is is a contemporary and modern today than when mm -hmm. it was created. Yeah, I mean, it's, you're totally correct. It, it, and when you see it, the the work in the flesh, uh, you know, in the retrospective, you, you it feels still really modern, and it, it says a lot about what Sonil was making then. Just on a when I talked that that whole first bit about ruptures in, in, in documentary photography practice, you know, the, it's really sophisticated and really sort of, you know, when you think about stuff like Philip Lorca de Corsi and Jeff Wall are making and, and, and all that kind of work, you know, Sunil's doing this as well at a similar time. And, and like you said, it, it just, it, there's so many layers to it. There's layers about, you know, interracial um, relationships, you know, the, the same sex relationships, different cultures, you know, there, there's so many different sort of layers to, to come into. And, you know, you know, it's a really, really interesting piece of work, which, you know, people from all backgrounds can, 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 should and, and, and can engage in and can enter it. It's, you know, 
as I said, when I, you know, I'm, I would be classed, I would call myself as, as straight and, and I was young to seeing this work, but it was, you know, it really informed me also what was going on in that world, in, in the world and what sort of a queer community was having to deal with at that, at that point in time. So I think it's, a, you know, you know, just the, the title alone, you know, is, is a brilliant title, Pretended Family Relationships. Excellent. So, you know, I think it's a really important piece of, piece of work. And the next um, person I want to talk about is Ingrid Pollard. And, and you know, this, is an, uh, this was 1988 that Ingrid made this work. And I, uh, you know, and, and a lot is talked, I'm sure, about a, a lot of Ingrid's work. And I know this is an old piece of work and, and Ingrid has made some great pieces, but for me, this was, a, was another radical, piece of work at that time you know I discovered it a bit later on at university and, and you know this relationship and when I'm talking about space and negotiating space the countryside for me myself I had a very sort of uneasy tense relationship to the countryside that my peers had who, who were making a lot of landscape work I didn't have that connection and I wasn't quite sure what that connection and when Ingrid this work I discovered this work it was like oh somebody understands somebody gets it so i understand what's going on here and, it, and you know it's a, it's, a, it's a real visual articulation of the uneasy relationship between race femininity and the english rural landscape and the issues that that come with all of this you know she, ingrid you know ingrid places herself in this picturesque scene a contemplative a contemplative figure in the landscape but there's always a sense of disconnection you know always something disconnected and suggests that Ingrid may be a tourist and it's juxtaposed with this text and you know and that you know text and image was being used as strategy to talk about you know sort of in some ways rally against the the notion of this this pure autonomous image being made that actually you know we're talking about the image had issues and signifiers and other things going on around it it wasn't this this pure space one of the things was the English landscape has a lot of, there's a lot of loaded sort of signifiers and symbolism it, that's been attached to it. And I think what, you know, the, a lot of the images ref, refer to a picturesque visual language of sort of a national trust. And it's, you know, the, the rural landscape has, has a lot of reference points. You know, you think about Cecil Shop's project of English nationalism and, and a, a harbour of English values, which was a very, it has to be said, a very middle-class interpretation of the landscape but you know Pollard as a person of colour cannot see oneself included in that space and I think that's really interesting and it doesn't it, it sort of articulates a tone of alienation exclusion and a different perception you know a, a black face in a sea of white I think what it was referred to um, and it actually amplifies these signifiers and I think it's really interesting. You know it also in the this series of these these pictures when I was looking at them it, it, one gets a sense that she's uncomfortable in that space. Always, yeah. Always there's a tension and she's very uncomfortable. Just look at this picture in particular, and there's a, a few others uh, that I was looking at. But this one, there's tension. It's like, almost like there's a, a knuckle sort of turning white and like, is there someone looking at me? And, you know, what, what are they saying? And, and so on, that I don't belong here, or do mm. I belong here? And so on. Well, and also the text, you know, it's, it's all, it's, you know, the text is important. It's as if the black experience is only lived within an urban environment. I thought I'd like the Lake District, where I wandered lonely as a black face in a sea of white. A visit to the countryside is always accompanied by a feeling of unease and dread. And it, and, and it works as a bigger metaphor on a level for a lot of people, black people, just living in the everyday life, you know, but... You, or even if you're born here, you may still feel like you're a tourist in a country that there's one that is your of your birth, and all the, you know, all the things that that are related to the, the English landscape harbour for me, and I, I get a lot of people um, this sense of English nationalism and uh, this sense of the purity in the landscape and representing this holding on to these very traditional so-called traditional old english values but also an order of things as well you know the landscape the, 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 the landowner and the surf and all these <laughs> other things and you know and, and also what 
I think it's, you know, a couple of the images are long. I think it is, you know, I think it's the third one. You know, it, it talks about, I think it's, it talks about there's a, there's an image which isn't here but there was one where there's a, there was a guy who's basically in a lake in, in a river and it looks like a very classic beautiful image the same as this one you know the classic image of someone looking out into the landscape and, and it talks about what made england great is founded on the blood of slavery and it sort of talks about all those great english values and traditions but bringing historical context to, into it but it's also you know there's another layer about you know the relationship to female in the landscape you know the, the explorer has always been the, the, the relationship with the male in the landscape is someone going in and dominating and, and kind of the explorer, you know, the, the landscape is very gendered in, in, in that sense. You know, you, when you think about landscape oh, photography yeah, as well. Yeah, that's going to be a, 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 another talk that we must do. Uh, yeah. Uh, that, that women yeah. tend not to be, you're absolutely right. They're not the explorers. They're not taking the journey, uh, uh, the objectification of, yeah. uh, of women in a, a more traditional role rather than the one that's going to, you know, explore the Antarctic and, mm -hmm. and, and do things. As a really, as for another talk, we must work on that. <laughs> It'd be a great collaboration. <laughs> Sorry. So, no, that's fine. No, it's fine. And I mean, yeah, that, that, and I think that's why this piece of work on, on many levels from just, just the, the strategies and just the, the issues that are going on, you know, in 88, it, it just, you know, it was a real seminal piece, I think, for me. And, and also just, you know, text and image you know, the, 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 it's breaking down sort of the, the old school notions of what a documentary photography can be and, and some and a constructed image as well, you know, going in and, and, and creating this and, and playing with tones and colors and, and reference points. You know, it, it really was a, you know, a real interesting piece of work. You know, I think it's really great. And I think that the third person I'm going to talk about here in this group is Joy Gregory. And this is more recent work of, of, of Joy's um, you know, Joy's known for the auto portraits, which is which was a brilliant set of images, which talks about basically um, the 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 sort of invisibility of, of, of black models or black women in in the fashion industry and and a lot of things. But this work I, I picked this recent piece of work, and it, it talks about this sort of space and invisibility. And the, I think it's a, it's a real significant piece of work, especially for now. Um, you know, the, the NHS has been used, I think, as a real symbolic device um, in the demonization of the immigrants. Um, I think it's been used really, really heavily um, for a long time. So the, this work was, was commissioned, um, it, was a, it was a work which was commissioned by Lewisham Hospital. Uh, it was a work celebrating 60 years of the NHS. And then after a year of research, um, Joy, from what, from what I, I, I've read, basically chose to focus on Marjorie Bell, who was an MBE. But what I think Joy found was, and, and, and May, Marjorie Bell was the first matron at the hospital under the NHS to be appointed in 48. But what Matron Bell found, oh, sorry, what Joy found in this, in this um, investigation of Matron Bell was the wealth of nurses and healthcare workers who basically came from the Caribbean. Now, you know, I, I have a connection with that. My mom was a nurse and she came from the Caribbean as well. And, you know, they, it was the notion that they came to build a dream from the mother country, um, the Windrush generation. And they were recruited by the government to become newly formed NHS staff. And, and, and they basically post-war, you know, Britain was basically was was desperately short of, and it must be said, qualified healthcare staff. Um, what's interesting is that, you know, the NHS, and we can talk even as, as, as um, recent as Brexit, it's been this sort of symbolic reference point um, for a metaphor or a narrative of a demise or erosion of English greatness or, or English values. And, and what it's actually done and what's been really interesting the way it's presented it has been this kind of one-way transaction that immigration has taken from the greatness of British rather than actually what the real transaction has been, which has been basically, you know, if you talk about slavery and you talk about also the, the, this whole new generation of people coming across from, from the so-called colonies to the mother country, of that they've contributed 
not just afterwards, but from the beginning of the NHS's sort of like creation. And, and they've been integral to this. And, and, and there's been an invisibility of this contribution in teaching and in history for quite a long time in the narrative of, of talking about, the, about this country. You know, you can see those wider sort of invisibilities, say for example, um, with Mary Seacole during the Crimea, Crimea War, you know, she was, she was a major nursing figure and she set up the British hospital, but she totally omitted, or was omitted for quite a long time from British history books during the Crimea War. So it's, but now Mary Seacole in later years has been, you know, amplified and, and, and been brought back into the history. So it, it's a really, really interesting, powerful piece of work. And, and it's, it, it's really clever because it's taking these archive images and, and then suddenly coloring in the women at the back who are from the colon, colonies and putting them in and saying, here are these women, they, they exist. They're not just in the background, that they were actually um, fundamental to building the great institution of the NHS, which people feel have been eroded by the immigration, or it's been used as a narrative, I think, to, to say that. We could move along with a, so, you know, and, and it's really interesting, the text who had left their homes, and it tells this story from with the text with the image, you know, of people leaving their homes, coming here to the motherland to, to serve. Um, and it's really interesting also in the sense of photography in the archive and representation in the sense of in the sense of the archive of these people just existing but also the way that if you look at I don't think Mark Seeley talks about this in decolonizing the camera there's um, a change sometimes in the way that representation is made it's never always sort of linear it's it, 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 it's you know before you had imagery of people from the colonies who were seen as like the children or needed to be looked after. Then during when people were needed during the war, during the colonies, the imagery and the promotion imagery had changed to people who had prospects and potential, and there was a sort of sense of equality. And that was used again in the recruitment from the, from, from the Caribbean. And so you have these images here kind of showing this same kind of image of equality. But then, it seems to change in later years and it seems to be this pattern of when people are needed from the colonies then it was a sort of more positive equal kind of representation going on Joanne, you know and, and there must have been something that, that, that uh when joy created these images she very much on purpose uh, uh took the caribbean characters in color Mm -hmm. and other in black and white and the, the you know the, which is very dramatic it's very very dramatic and uh, i'm not sure how she did it because it's obviously film and, and so on but that also is part of you know the, the visual storytelling that she's doing there she's creating an even deeper focus on yeah. on, on the caribbean uh, uh, uh actors versus uh the the other staff that uh, are in the national health service and and I, I, without knowing what her background is, but I think it's an important uh, uh, technique that she employed for this uh, for this series of work. Yeah, it's a perfect technique. I think mean, it's. You know, I think it might be the next image along. There should be one more. You know, but that you know articulates it so well. There, you yeah. know, it's it, you know, it's a it's a brilliant photographic strategy, and that's why you know it's interesting for me as, as in photographic terms you know this from the across the commonwealth you've got this constant little tone and reminder and then just in the imagery alone you, you know the, this because it's about that that there's been this invisibility and joy is amplifying the visibility through this photographic technique of exactly. monochromatic meet, meets color um uh, color um sort of presentation and i think that's a really simple device but extremely effective device of articulating what you know all the issues around this um and i think it's a it's a really great piece of work and, and it's the latest piece of work as well so i thought it was it was interesting to talk about that and 
many different layers and levels. The next piece of work I'm showing is, is actually an American photographer and his name is Armani Willett and it's called The Parallel Road and this came out very, this year, very recently, last year. It's a brilliant book and it's basically, uh, it's based around the Negro Motorist Green Book, which was an Amer African American um, uh, booklet which basically it was it was created during the rise of the black middle classes in America and you know obviously faced with discrimination the book provided names of services which were relatively friendly to African American drivers yeah. and what's amazing about this work it, you know we go back this thing of everyday space uh, and sort of negotiation you know the American road trip is is firmly rooted in the American vernacular and it is connection to expression of the American dream it, and it's something that James Guimon refers to in American photography and the American dream this sort of constant articulation of of, of sort of the road you know pioneering um, freedom and expression and all those things and American photographers you know when you think of what are classed with, with the sort of the canon American photographers or even painters you know um, th they reflected this, this American vernacular and one of the things that I'd always thought about is could a black photographer really do the American road trip in the same way say Stephen Shaw or Alex Sock looking at you know the, the reality of a, a black person he, to be able to engage in every day they write and you know what Willett is suggesting that no you can't because you know in your car it could be actually the one of the most dangerous places for you to be as well it's, a, it's an ominous space it's, it's a space which is a reminder of discrimination and what um, what it does with the photography is really interesting. He mixes archive and actually sort of like, you know, the images that he's made interlaced with the Negro motorist uh, green book to try and sort of articulate this kind of fear and this kind of problem. I think if we go to the next image, we'll probably see how, so there you have, you know, a police, driver shooting a black person in the car. We know about loads of those incidents happening, you know, um, quite regularly. And this image as well on the left, which is just this empty, or very quite ominous sort of evening night scene. And so, you know, what you've got, what is this sort of, what Armani Willett is, is presenting imagery that, that appears to be quite ominous. There's always a sense of danger. There's always a, a, a sense of, of sense of uh, sort of like a bone, like every day could be, you have to think about your mortality as a black person, which is very different to let's say the classic American photographic road trips of Stephen Shaw or say even Alex Soth, you know, that there's a different kind of relationship going on there in the image and Armani is trying to present well this is not the same for us and it, and it, and it works as a wider metaphor for sort of um, the black um, person's existence maybe in a, in, let's say in American society but there's always a sense of, of, of thinking about your mortality in the everyday within your own space um, and I really like the way as well that Armani sort of has these obviously images that he's made next to sort of footage or imagery from the past or imagery from mass media as well because that's where we take a lot of our sort of reference points you know every day in imagery is from mass media and culture so um you know i think this is a really interesting piece of piece of work to talk about this subject matter which relates to photography, relates to the myth of photography, relates to, relates to romance of photography, but also relates to the romanticism, romanticism of the American dream. I think there might be another image that might show that as well. Yeah, Jermaine, no, I guess it's John I'm Henry, sorry. On this because we're... Yeah, sure. And so the next one is John Henry with Strange Fruit. Um, so John Henry is another American photographer and I thought I'd use him as an example. Um, I think he's, he's really interesting, John Henry. You know, Strange Fruit is, is the name of the song. Um, I think it's Billie Holiday, is it? Strange Fruit? Mm, Billie Holiday. Yeah, Strange Fruit. And obviously it talks about um, 
you know, it, it, it talks about, you know, the basically the lynching the death of, um, of, of, of young black men and what John Henry wanted to do. He made these images and what they are, they're kind of reconstructions. Now, the mothers in the actual images, they haven't lost their sons. Their sons are in the images themselves. But what he kind of wanted to do, which I thought was really interesting, was try and set up this kind of this sort of um, imagery, which actually sort of refers or even sort of reflects the sort of religious iconography painting of, of, of Jesus in the arms of his mother, the Virgin Mary, at the bottom of the cross after the crucifixion. And there's a real suggestion of sort of emptiness and, and death and forebodeness. And I think, you know, Henry had talk, talked about the emptiness after all the journalists have left, after all the protests have gone, after the news have gone, the families are left on their own. And it's like a performance, a metaphor of racial theatre. And I think it's really interesting. It's another conversation about the everyday. It's another conversation about the black experience and, and thinking about this sort of your sense of mortality. You know, that obviously young children, teenagers um, have, been, have been photographed, black teenagers have been have been. Have been killed, shot by the police or in different situations. And I think it was a, it's a really interesting kind of strategy and a different take on trying to talk about that, that conversation. Obviously, you know, this is quite point of image, one image in front of the White House at that time, it, you know, when you look at it, when you think about the context, there was Trump. So that amplified the whole thing about the conversation. Obviously now we have Biden. So, you know, you know it has a different kind of resonance because that happens with images and, and context. Um, and, you know, the image also carries, you know, the weight of um, American history as well. And I think it's, 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 and it's also, I think it really, it's subject matter is very dark and very kind, you know, painful, but there is still a kind of beauty to the images that draws you in. I think maybe the next image sort of shows, you know, the school as well. You know, being maybe you know photographed outside of school, the location is very important, um, and, and there's a the sense of softness there. On, on this series, you know, that because I've, I've looked at it a few times, for me, it, it asks a lot of questions of the viewer. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Like, how has this happened? What What is this story uh, uh, all about? We know it's staged. You know, it's not referenced. Yeah. Obviously, it's, it's definitely constructed, but it it asks questions and you say, well, how am I going to get the answers? Who's going yeah. to tell me how to respond to what, I, what I'm uh, experiencing, what I'm witnessing? And I think that's really important. You know, the work's not trying to be didactic. It's not trying no. to say that these answers, and I think what's beautiful about it is that it draws you in and it forces you to make, try and make those kind of thought processes, those kind of sort of, you know, relationships and maybe have a conversation out so, you know, so I think that's why it's a really, really interesting and named Strange Fruit as well. You know, what it refers to is the the killing, the lynching, the, the, the destruction of, of, of black teenagers and black, the black people. And I think it's a very, very, very sophisticated, and I think also beautiful piece of work and very poignant. And I think there's a lot of also, it's quite important, there's emotion involved in it. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, the next piece of work we're going to look at, I think, is Marcia Michael, who's a uh, British photographer. Um, and it's, these images are part of a larger piece of work. And, and this is also talks of works about the absence of, of imagery um, of, of black existence. And it's really about the absence of black families from British archives. Um, and, and it's interesting because the, and it's a reaction to that. And these images are, are, are contemporary images as well. They're not images of, of her family from the past that, you know, it, 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 it also suggests to a, an era, an era, maybe 19th century archive photography. Um, but, but what I really love about these images that, you know, for this one, for example, there's a real sort of intimate, you know, intimacy and actually quite, you know, that they're both, you know, her mother, it's, it's her, her mother and father, her mother's neck, like, you know, topless. And they're sitting there, uh, very much a matter of fact. Um, and it, it's not a very stereotypical narrative that that's being portrayed. Um, I think there's also a real tenderness as well. Um, 
and I like the way that they, you know the, the, the thing isn't really fixed. You know it can't be from the past because the clothing suggests it's sort of slightly modern, but you're not quite sure. I think that's kind of kind of good. It's not really giving you anything as well in that sense of in the same as Henry's. There's no answers being given. But what I really like about this is that you know we we see a lot of imagery from the past of people who are black if they are in archives or or now there's there's a you know a particular kind of sort of reference point, and I think here Marcia is really trying to break it against that sort of imagery from the black diaspora in the in the archives. Um, I think the next image is of um, I think this might be Marcia's daughter actually. And, <laughs> these people. That's so this is Marcia's, um, Marcia's mother. Mother. I assumed it, but I just yeah. want to be clear. Yeah, sorry. So the, and that's why it's been in the, in the whole album. It's, the, it's, it's basically the, the, the project is, is a family album. Right. Okay. And it's her family and it's the study of kin. Right. And I think, you know, and there's, there's images of herself where she's, she's leaning on her mother very tenderly. There's the ones of her, of her, of her you know, the first image of mother and father. And then there's one which I, I think is Marcy, which is Marcy's, and here's one of the, of the mother. And, and it's a really beautiful, tender image. And it's actually very matter of fact and raw, and it's away from sort of like retouching, manipulation, a sense of, of that sense. It's, it's very, very raw and matter of fact. And, I, and I, I just love the images for their sort of kind of poignancy and intimacy. And so the next set of images is, is by Andrew Jackson, who's from the West Midlands, and it's basically Promise City. And it's an interesting piece of work. I mean, Andrew has worked a lot in the West Midlands. Now, Promise City is basically a piece of work, which is, it was about um, a 20 story tower box, a very troubled kind of, kind of um, estate and a block in Aston, which was earmarked for demolition. It was it's it was transformed into temporary accommodation later on, uh, centre for the homeless instead. Um, and basically, you know, the, the, he was invited inside Birmingham City Council to to basically create a, a solution to the city housing crisis. Carl Jackson, so Jackson came in, Andrew, and it's a really really interesting, you know, piece of work looking at how these people's lives you know are about to be transformed and changed you know they there was this sort of community and now this community is is going to be will kind of disappear from barry jackson tower um in, in, in here there's a really beautiful text in the images as well which is, says empty green washing lines transverse the space like laser lights in barry jackson's tower and 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 just basically you you what i love about this you just have what's left you know basically possessions left behind and i think in the next image you know here we have elderly man reform church and so it, ref it also refers to what is also around that it's not just about the tower but the infrastructure and the community that will now probably disappear from around the tower you know for these lives for these people their infrastructure will be gone their homes will be gone their lives will be changed they may be displaced and put in in other areas and what i like about this work as well which andrew is talking about it goes it goes sort of across not just race but also class and different group people who've inhabited in this place. You know, day of their removal from Melbourne Avenue. And, and, and you know, as troubled and maybe as, you know, there was a lot of demonization of council estates and sink estates by the Cameron administration. You know, these people were, who, grew, who were living in these places were seen as troublesome and, and, and demonized in society. And, you know, a lot of, we could talk about gentrification as well and development and what happens after that, you know, what happens to these communities and what's replaced. As I said, in the end, this, this was not knocked down in the end. It was basically turned into um, temporary housing. Um, and you kind of wonder where all these people's, people have gone from Promise City. And the title alone, you know, suggests almost in some ways broken promises, you know, when, when these blocks were created, it were part of a utopian 
kind of um, project of housing, but in some ways, through different sort of neglect and reasons by councils and, and, and other things, they, they became something very different. But it, within these places were still very strong communities. Um, so for Andrew's work, it's very interesting in the sense of the documents, you know, Dale, Dave Volunteer, Aston Reform Church, and except, you know, they, they all still work, even though they, li they live in this block and they still work in the community and there's an infrastructure to the community that now will disappear. So the next piece of work is by Raya Dillon, which is Sunday Best. And, you know, I, I picked this work in, in a sense of, you know, we're talking about that, that thing about space and about existing space. So, so Raya's work was, so the two photographers coming along, Ronan and, and, and uh, Rhea, they, they were both part of an exhibition created by Ronan and it was called Home. And it was basically um, another thing about a space and recording the black experience, the mundane, the everyday, and, and, and it was elevation of a black experience, you know, presenting normal situations and, and away from fetishized binary imagery um, of black women. Um, and what I really liked about this was like, you know, Ray was creating this archive um, and these series of images of the, the culture of diaspora. Um, and, the, and the Sunday Best was a, a piece of work which was basically, you know, recording her, her grandmother in her Sunday Best, a, a record of a ritual and heritage dressing up on a, so a Sunday. And, you know, that's often related to um, going to church. You know, my, my, my mother does it, you know, my grandmother did it. Um, something familiar in black backgrounds. Um, I know that sort of people see this as kind of almost like a, you know, that's been shown before and it's, a, it's almost like a stereotype. But, it, you know, it, it's something that does exist. And, and, I, and what Rhea was just going, showing this tradition of something going on and, and recording these everyday small experiences and something that is, is very special and about memory. And, you know, and, you know, that he, history of recording the working classes dressing up the weekend say Tom was a Shirley but you know that, that there's a thing about a ritual but the weekend and dressing up has been very important to the to the working classes uh, you know in a wide in a, in a wider sort of representation so I think that you know in a photographic terms I think that falls into that tradition but, but the way that she does it here is very composed and 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 very centered and and very direct and it's slightly underlit and and it does it feels very sort of like elevated and, and a special moment, but something that's repeated this ritual every sort of Sunday. And the next work I thought I'd use as well was Ronan's work, which basically is a depiction of uh, Mother Margaret. Now, the reason why I picked this imagery as well is also that it was a conversation about um, also the way that imagery can be used in mass culture or popular culture. I mean, you know, this imagery was used for an underwear campaign. And I thought that really interesting. You know, this thing about, we think about photographs and talk about photographs in a gallery space and in particular sort of high culture. But in reality, you know, when we think about it, a lot of the things that influence as influence society are in, are in mass popular culture, in the mainstream advertising, TV. And I thought it was interesting that, that the way that Ronan depicts her mother Margaret in the in the under in her underwear in these very everyday mundane situation. I mean, the I think the commission comes from a project that she made basically about her mother and sort of in the everyday. And I really like that she recreates this, you know. And I think you know, if you, you know, to accomplish anything, you must first expect it of yourself. I think that's a really interesting layer in the image. You know, it, it, it talks about like a confidence and an acceptance, you know, it's not retouched. You know, I, can we, I think there's another image, the long, you know, it's, it's, I am a woman and this is how I look and this is how I am and accept that, you know. And I, I think it's, it, it seems like a very simple device and the images aren't spectacular either in the sense of there's not dramatic lighting, there's not a, a kind of, you know, dramatic poses. They're very, very sort of matter of fact. Obviously they're deliberate. Obviously there's, they're not just sort of, they appear that they could be mundane snapshots, something that you could probably find in a family album, but there's, 
but in this setting and then in the context of something that could be advertising underwear campaign, it takes on a very different resonance. And I, and I really love that about how these images are used in, in this campaign and how Ronan used that to try and talk about, you know, body politics and, and, and talking about sort of, sort of owning and, and grabbing that, that thing back, which, which works in a tradition of, of, of female um, photographers, artists who've come before in the past. So I think there's really interesting sort of reference points in that. And I think that I'm going to have a, a show on this. My, my recollection. Sorry. I, uh, wasn't Ronan going to um, have an exhibition on that? I, I, I thought that was planned originally. I know it's, it's probably canceled. It was supposed to be in all. I think it was supposed to be in all. I, yeah, I mean, it, I think there was there was that sounds like there was some that sounds so familiar. I have a yeah. funny feeling. I noticed that she's also. Um, open home the gallery which is yeah. um in hornsey road which takes that philosophy from the first exhibition into this this setting um you know and i think that's that's that was the also the thing as well with those pictures you know it was in the home as well in a domestic setting it wasn't in some like dramatic kind of exotic location it was it was you know in the everyday just in your underwear, which we probably spent a lot of during this period of time in lockdown. <laughs> so it's, I think it's a great way to sort of end my sort of presentation of photographers. Well, I think a song is trying to uh, I, I get on uh, uh, now. I Sorry, song. <laughs> I, I, I hope she'll be here shortly. One of the things I want to ask both of you when when, uh, when, when song finishes her presentation, I think is it, just going back to actually what the name uh, of, of, uh, of this particular uh, uh, talk is, and it's the influence of e ethnic diversity and photography. Mm. And I'd be really curious, you know, as I said, one of the most amazing things during this whole preparation and pulling together this talk is the very, very rapid ramp uh, uh, educational thing that I have been on, learning about artists that I, I was not familiar with. And I'm just thinking, you know, here we are in the 21st century, and um, what what kind of impact, you know, now that there is a greater awareness and, and there's more exposure, uh, are we learning? To, uh, were they only influencing within the community or has their body of work now had a, 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 a larger voice, you know, something that is more visible, if you, if you know what I mean, rather than just kind of amongst oh, you know the family the community that we are familiar with uh, that it has a, a wider audience to be looking at it and thinking about it and, and so on uh, and, and especially when I'm thinking about you know uh, the, the the idea of decolonizing the camera and if you're going to decolonize the, the camera and make it more democratic rather than autocratic or very biased as we know it has been over the years not just biased in terms of uh, a color creed and ethnicity but also you know uh not too long ago and in many places 90 percent of photographers are male white purple or green and they're not female or forget about the ethnicity at this point and i'm just thinking you know where you're coming from and and and, and what your knowledge is which is vast um, do you see, uh, are you looking into the future, the kind of impact at last, hi, Song. Sorry, I was having internet problems. Oh, that, well, welcome to the, <laughs> the lovely to see you. Uh, we must pick up this conversation uh, after Song, welcome. It's so good to uh, uh, see you and uh, thank you for uh, uh, joining. And I'm just going to hand uh, the, the plate over to you so that you can just jump in or do whatever you like. Oh, great. Okay. Um, if you could let me share the screen, that would be great. I'll get that to Pranvira to do that. Yes, please. Okay. 
here I am again. Hi, everybody. Hi, Jermaine. Hi, Carol and Pembera. It's nice to see you all. Um, thank you very much to the Frontline Club for inviting um, all of us to speak on um, the issue of ethnic diversity in photography. And I just had the great joy of listening to Jermaine speak about um, the work that he was presenting. And, and um, as I was looking at it, I, I was reminded very much, and I think, Carol, this is something you had said as well, that um, there was a lot of overlap between our um, topics of conversation, and, and I think so, and actually um, this gives us an opportunity to hopefully expand upon that conversation as well. Um, so um, I wanted to speak to you today about um, what I do, which is as a photo historian and as a uh, professor of photo theory, one of the important things that I think we can do as educators and curators is um, the work of decolonizing the archive. Um, and so the work that I wanted to show you today deals with um, sort of problematic instantiations of photography with the archive in terms of the designation of the other um, as uh, marked categories. Um, as well as how photographic practice can actually um, intervene on the archive itself by creating recontextualized um, work and as an act of reappropriation. And so that's sort of the work that I wanted to, to go over today. Um, and one of the guiding um, ideas that I have in terms of decolonizing the archive comes from the great photographer and photo theorist, Alan Sekula, who in his seminal article, The Body and the Archive, um, um, stated that archival potentials change over time. And I think this is a really important idea to think about photography not as simply practice or simply materiality or simply objects, but actually as cultural products and as cultural products that take on lives that may not have been intended by the makers of the photographs or the framers of the photographs or the archivists of that work. Um, in the body and the archive, uh, Secula traces the ways in which the body of the other was identified, named, cataloged um, in the early days of photography. Um, it is not unimportant to note, by the way, that the coincident rise of photography um, was also with that of the pseudosciences of phrenology, physiognomy, and polygenis. Um, phrenology and physiognomy both refer to um, external bodily uh, features as being indicative, indicative excuse me, of um, um, internal characteristics um, and as signs of mental capability. This is also very much in line with this idea of polygenis, which is that there is actually um, a, a belief that there is a racial superior and that this was very much about the superiority of the white Western primarily male body. And so photography moves in a really interesting space in the 19th century, again, because so many people who believed in these uh, pseudosciences actually harnessed the photo uh, power of the indexicality of photography to provide evidence to support these claims. Um, and obviously, this is a really important concept because the way that we represent anything, the way that we represent the world is a form of organization. It's a way of understanding and organizing the world and making sense of it. And so if we are to think that the way that the world was organized for the West visually, we can certainly start to understand some of the tactics used in the early 19th century towards the creation of the other. So I thought that I would start with um, the very famous um, Agassiz daguerreotypes, which are in Harvard's Peabody uh, Museum. And these were um, commissioned by Louis Agassiz, who was a Swiss phrenologist. And he is the founder, or was the founder, I should say, of Harvard University's Museum of Comparative Zoology. This department actually still exists at Harvard. Um, he was a leading polygenist as well and believed in the superiority of the white body over the other body. Um, and so he had hired um, a photographer who was based in the South um, by the name of Joseph T. Zeely in Columbia, South Carolina. And over the course of about a year in 1850, um, he made these daguerreotypes for Agassiz. Um, they are, uh, they consist of a father and daughter, Renty and Delia um, and a few other slaves and they these were really about showing otherness um, and it is a scientific look at the body. 
This was Dr. Robert Gibbs, who assisted Agassiz in the biomedical aspect of his studies. And so as you can see from these images, it's clear that these bodies were held up for inspection. And the audience for these bodies was, of course, scientific white Americans. Um, and so when we look at these works, we can see how certainly a certain kind of depiction of the black body, particularly in post-slavery America, started to take hold of the popular imagination. And so I wanted to bring in this incredible image. Um, this is a carte de visite portrait, which was made in 1864 by the Black American abolitionist Sojourner Truth. And here you see um, the relationship between image and text. Um, and it says, I sell the shadow to support the substance. And so Sojourner Truth was actually remarkably well aware of her role as an icon or as a symbol for the abolitionist movement. She also understood very well the power of visual culture and the way in which she represents herself. And you can see very clearly in the objects of that are presented in this carte de visite that there is, if you can see sort of slowly on the screen here, um, a book which would represent literacy um, and some items of domestic labor which also underpin her womanness. So if you look at this carte de visite, which takes place approximately at the same time as these representations, you can see how actually tremendously powerful the idea of counter representation is. These were happening concurrently, right? There was no huge gap between these time periods. So a Black conscious visual culture emerges at the same time as actually a quite racist visual culture. These are images um, that were made by a uh, British um, missionary, um, Alice Lee Smith. And these are images that show um, some of the brutality faced by the Congolese um, due to King Leopold of Belgium, who was responsible for the genocide and mutilation and torture of approximately 10 million Congolese Africans in the late 1800s. Um, it is arguable that the wealth of modern Belgium is directly related to this brutal era of colonization and exploitation. British and US audiences first saw these images in 1904. Again, they were taken by uh, missionaries and they were used in the UK based Congo reform campaigns materials to both raise humanitarian awareness and as a way to lobby towards the end of the crimes um, and the occupation by the Belgians. But they also served a very, very dual purpose, which is one to document the crime, as well as to assert the humanity of the victims. And by extension, worth saving is very much the missionary endeavor. And one can argue that the missionary endeavor itself, itself is in fact colonial. It has been suggested um, by many photo theorists and scholars that um, these images um, have very much shaped how we see and picture human rights abuses even to this day. This particular image is of Nisala with the remains of his daughter, which as you can see are just um, a hand and a foot. One of the common methods of punishment that was favored by the Belgians would be the um, would be cutting off the hands and feet of the workers' children in order to motivate them to work harder. So the crime against the body was actually enacted against children and not the workers themselves because the workers needed their hands and feet, right? And so this sort of surrogation of body parts as, um, as a, as a symbol of, of violence becomes a really, really important part in this kind of philanthropic photography, which ends mid-century. Um, this is an image of the, um, yes. Can I just stop you uh, there? Because you, you said something that and actually, I had to take a deep breath. And you, you know, I'm very familiar with the, with the genocides in Africa, particularly I've been covered in Rwanda. And the, the, the stat that you said, 10 million Congolese. Africans, it, yes. It was a genocide. It was in, There's no doubt about it. But the, and we weren't using the word genocide in the day because that didn't happen until after World War II with the That's United right. Nations and so on. Yes. And I'm just curious, um, in studying history and how history is taught, the wider thing, not just because of the visual imagery that has given the evidence of what's happened, was not the rest of the Western world uh, 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 aware 
of what was happening? Was it not being publicized at the time? 10 million is a massive number. I mean, it's more than the 6 million Jews that, uh, that were uh, yes. uh, killed during World War II and the over 1 million uh, 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 Tutsis and sympathetic Hutus during the Rwandese war. So can, can, can you contextualize that? It's such an unbelievable uh, visual also. It's, uh, it's, it is, it is an unbelievable visual. There are far more graphic images that I just, I, I have a personal hard time replicating, uh, reproducing images. Uh, of, of that kind of violence. I, I think that this stands in very well for a lot of it. Um, I think that there's a lot of things at play here. And I think you pointed to one of them, which is that genocide is a modern term. Um, and so language creates worlds, right? Um, and so if the language isn't there to talk about it, then this imaginative world where we can imagine 10 million people being killed, right, becomes possible. The second thing too, is we have to remember that our distaste for colonialism is a very recent thing. Um, and so I, I, I think that the reckoning that the West is having and, and, and to quote Karl Marx a little bit is that, you know, at some point the specters of the past catch up to you. Right, and I think that you we see that now sort of happening both in the U.S. with what's happening with um, the ongoing civil rights movement here, as well as you know the destabilization of the Middle East and of Africa, which has created um, serious uh, refugee crises in, in in the European Union. And so, um, again, I think that these things take a little bit of time to catch on. The the third reason. That, that I think is that, you know, Belgium wasn't really publicizing this and the industry of photography and photojournalism where we were able to, you know, travel the world and document these things just wasn't as prevalent, right? So it, it, it's, it's a combination of a lot of historical factors, I feel. But I think a, the, the most disturbing aspect is the ideal, ideological factor of this, um, which is that, I, I, again, I don't think that people really understood how bad colonialism was. Right, and especially if you think about media and who controls the discourse and who controls the dialogue, very few nations are really interested in airing their dirty laundry. Uh, you see this playing out today between uh, Turkey and the US, right? President Biden declared Armenia that to, to be a genocide. And so what does Turkey do? They say, that how dare you revise history? Now we're gonna make a statement that you Americans committed genocide against the Native Americans. It, it becomes a circular argument, right? So, you know, I think that it, again, it is about the controlling of information. And I think that a large part of why this is really sort of still unknown and unspoken about is probably something similar to why the Armenian genocide is something unknown and spoken about is because powerless people generally don't have the power and the ability to tell their own stories or even get their stories told, especially in the late 19th century. Understood. Yeah. So, you know, that, and, and again, I think that also our access to information is so different now, you know, um, and, and, and I think that's a, the, the information flow is a huge part of it. And, you know, what's something that I tell my students in university all the time is that photography is one of those things that is almost completely dependent on technology in order for it to be disseminated. And so if there are no systems of dissemination in place, then the stories don't get told. And we can, you know, go into many of the ideological and hegemonic reasons why certain stories don't get told, but that is my instinctive answer to you as to why most people don't talk about this. I think you hit the nail on, uh, on the head, you know, certainly with the most recent trial and so on, if there wasn't a video as evidence in the George Floyd uh, uh, case, they would have had a hell of a time, the uh, prosecution, to be able to prove what had happened. And so, yeah. Yeah, indeed. And uh, I, I, you know, it's not that I'm not devoid uh, of what kind of technology, but you know, when these pictures is just how history is written. That's a separate subject. Carry on with your presentation because it's very interesting. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, and so, yes, just to continue further, this is um, uh, the second image that I selected from these images that were taken by Alice Lee Smith. Um, and to note too that these were not made by professional photographers or photojournalists. They were made by the missionaries themselves. So they obviously 
have a slightly propagandistic twist to them as well. So I just I also wanted to put that out there. Um, but this is a really interesting image because I think, um, you know, Jermaine and Carol, both as, as, as working, you know, practitioners of photography, we don't make images like this anymore, certainly not in the field, um, and for very good reason. Um, and, and this is, again, about visual culture and how the picturing of bodies really changes. Um, although one could argue that this is a a staged group photo shoot. Um, the participation of the African children in this in, in this photograph actually stands as their mute testimony, um, and it is very much orchestrated by the white gaze. Um, she is standing sort of at the top of this sort of human pyramid of people, and and it's a really problematic visual metaphor. Um, and so these. Images should also make us wonder in historical imagery how consensual these interactions are. Are they truly collaborations between the subject and the photographer? Um, or are they further you know, implications of the white gaze upon the black body, whether it's for otherness or for philanthropic reasons? Because one can argue that they still stem from the same place of otherness and representation. Um, and so in looking at images like that, I wanted to take us back a couple of years um, to the Paris Exposition of 1900, um, which took place in Paris, France, um, about, uh, they think somewhere between six to eight million people um, came. Mm -hmm. And that year, uh, the, the Paris officials had asked W.E.B. Du Bois and Thomas J. Calloway, who assisted him, to create an exhibition called the American Negro Exhibit. Um, and this was a really wonderful opportunity for Du Bois, who was actually not a curator, but a sociologist, um, to talk about the Black body in a way that I would refer to as counter-hegemonic and counter-archival. And so this collection of images um, included 500 photographs, as well as 32 charts, um, including this beautiful chart, which is on the screen, as well as numerous maps that depicted various um, immigration and migration patterns of Black Americans as well as a display of about 200 books written by African Americans. And these images were all presented without any captions whatsoever. And they really were about depicting Black life in America. And um, they're, they're really quite wonderful, I think. Fabulous, fabulous. Yeah. There's an incredible quality. And as you see these, you can also see how blackness in America is not a monolithic term, that there are different ways of being black and different ways of existing. Um, and so when you think about the sheer normalcy of this work, and I think Jermaine spoke about this um, a, a bit in his presentation about the importance and the politics of daily life, right? And, and how that is actually such a great intervention on images that show otherness. And so when you have images such as the Agassiz daguerreotypes, which try to depict otherness as a specimen or as something that exists in defect, when you have blackness that is shown as celebratory and in a normalizing way, then it becomes something that is really counter archival and it stands as in a way a rebuke against the work that is being done at the same time concurrently. Um, and so I thought that I would move away from historical imagery and talk about how contemporary photographers have decolonized the archive and sought different ways of representation. Um, and so this is a very wonderful photograph. Um, it is called um, East and West um, Shaking Hands at laying of last rail. And this was made um, on May 10th, 1869 by the photographer American J, uh, sorry, Andrew J. Russell. Um, it's referred to as the champagne photograph. And this image commemorates the joining of the East and West um, intercontinental um, railroads, which for the very first time joined the West Coast to the East Coast. And so this was a celebration um, that literally was the last spike and it commemorates the workers who worked on this um, railroad project. 
all of the workers um, here that are depicted are white. Um, and we know from history that in fact, um, more than half of the workers who worked on this railroad were Chinese Americans. And so in 2014, uh, the Chinese American photographer, uh, Corky Lee, who was based here in New York and who sadly just passed away last year, recreated this image in 2014. And he speaks about how he had seen this image so much in his childhood and that he knew also from history that there was an exclusion. And I quote from him when he says, history, at least photographically, says that the Chinese were not present. And so here's the image taken at the exact same spot of the champagne photograph. And all the people who are represented here are actual descendants of the original Chinese workers. This is a marvelous act, I think, of decolonizing the archive and intervening directly upon history. And it is something that can be done in a very contemporary way. And it required some research on his part on his part to find all of the family members, but what emerges in the conversations and um, a, a lot of the personal narratives are find, found in the uh, Chinese American Museum is that the family members themselves had a very difficult reckoning with history because by then they were fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh generation Americans and their history had been completely removed from the photographic archive and certainly of the American archive. So this is a really, really powerful act of reclamation. And finally, I wanted to speak about um, one of my favorite bodies of work and uh, really, I think, one of the most powerful um, interventions on the archive. And this is by the American photographer, Carrie Mae Weems. Uh, this project is called From Here I Saw What Happened and I Cried. Um, and it was made in 1995. They are um, 28 chromogenic color prints uh, with text sandblasted on glass. She re-photographed the archival images and you will see some of our images making a return here. Um, there are two that are toned blue and the rest are all toned in red. Um, and a little bit of an interesting backstory is that when um, Kermi May Weems asked the Peabody Museum for permission to re-photograph um, the Dagasi's uh, daguerreotypes, they originally told her no. Um, she had to go back several, several times to ask for permission. Um, and that will come into a little story that I'll tell you at the end. Um, and so these are all found photographs. Some of them are by famous photograph photographers, including Gary Winogrand, um, as well as the Agassiz art, um, archive images. And she tells a really phenomenal story here about how photography has maybe purposefully, maybe inadvertently supported racism and that Actually, looking back now, she acknowledges that some of these misrepresentations were actually quite intentional. And so these images are um, displayed as a linear uh, uh, chronological narrative, and you can see the text, which is etched. I won't read all of the text for you, but it starts with, from here, I saw what happened. And here they are, the Dagasi's daguerreotypes. And, and, and again, the importance of the relationship between text and image here, she's really addressing what happened to these images, right? Because they took on a life of their own. You became a scientific profile, a Negroid type, an anthropological debate, and a photographic subject. And she goes through and takes the viewer on this really remarkable journey through history in which the black body moves through these very separate realms of representation. Um, and to refer back to W.E. Du Bois a little bit, one of his seminal contributions to American racial theory is the idea of double consciousness. The idea that one's own identity is, especially as, and particularly specifically um, as a Black American, was that you construct your identity was constructed not only by how you saw yourself, but your knowledge that people saw you differently, right? It's the embodiment of racism. Um, and so these images really speak to this idea that so much of the representation and the construction of Black identity in America particularly was done outside of the Black body and ordered by the white supremacist gaze. And so here you see 
her using text to really talk about and in a way that should make us feel slightly uncomfortable, the way in which these images created a false narrative about blackness, right? Born with a veil, you become root worker, juju mama, voodoo queen, hoodoo doctor. And I love that she uses the word veil here, born with the veil, because that was another part of W.E. Boyce's theory about double consciousness was that that Black Americans had the ability to see through the veil, that they were in fact conscious of the fact that their identities were often constructed outside of themselves. So it's this real tacit acknowledgement of the duality of the Black visual experience and the ways in which Black women have been both denigrated and sexualized. the way that colorism was enacted in order to create further segregations within the community. And she ends with, and I cried. And again, this is um, these two African women who are facing each other and, and really, I think, having a conversation about history. And, and I always get a little bit of a tingle when I get to the end of this, because I think that she's asking us to really take a step back and think about what it means to, to decolonize. And, and I think um, as, people who work in photography, we can talk about the ways in which as an industry, we can make things better and that we can decolonize. Um, as an educator, I can tell you that we can do those things, but they are, those are only band-aids for a larger systematic set of injustices and inequalities. If we don't desegregate our schools, if we don't decolonize the academy, if we continue to overfund the police at the expense of mental health services and education, then there is no way that we can decolonize the arts. We don't exist in a silo. Um, what we do especially is very much touched by the world and what we do is especially um, consumed by the world. And so to, to say that the systems that govern um, why inequities happen and why injustices happen um, would be silly because uh again um you know the disparity of representation in photography of photo editors of photographers this happens at these lower levels you know why are there so many fine art programs mfa programs and you look at the the makeup of the students it gets more and more segregated within higher prestige programs i, I teach in one and i can tell you that there are not that many students of color and and so when you look at those demographics, then you see how, you know, the people who make decisions later on, those people who become curators and, you know, editors, there's, they haven't been desegregated from the beginning, right? And so it trickles up, those ideologies trickle up. They don't trickle down, they actually trickle up. And so um, as an advocate for decolonizing the, um, the archive and finding greater diversity in photography, I think that that is actually a larger push for us to find greater diversity and, and really bringing in marginalized voices from the very beginnings of education and, uh, you know, all levels of society. I, I think that this is not a sole photography issue. Um, I think it is a an issue that we can, you know, work towards. But, but yeah, I think it, this is a larger conversation than just photography. And that's it. Uh, that's it. You know, the issues you raise. I think all of us, and, and particularly, you know, I think Jermaine and I, we, we're photojournalists. We're keen uh, uh, observers, at least I hope we're keen observers of what's happening around us. And, and you see injustices and you see the inequality and you try to raise the flag and give a voice to the voices, a visual voice that at times I think can be more powerful, certain imagery that both uh, Jermaine that you presented today and, and, and Song, you know, it, it hits your heart really hard and you're asking a lot of questions. And, you know, as a responsible, intelligent, person and there are many out there, you say, well, what can I do? Uh, uh, what 
what force, what piece of energy uh, can, uh, and can I instigate, can I initiate to become more aware? But given what you said earlier, Song, and we, we can talk a little bit uh, about that, technology is the fuel uh, that drives the, 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 the fire that explodes and allows us to reach instantly in a much wider audience than the earliest days of what photography was allowed, which was a much more privileged environment. And, you know, this is not an easy thing. You know, you, you, you're a campaigner, Song. And I, I, <laughs> anyone, that, anyone that knows me well enough and says that she's always on the march against something and getting arrested and God knows what else. But it's, it's important, the kind of voice that you're talking about, to be asking the questions, to be able to, to, be able to find a visual uh, a, a platform that can allow the change and the trigger the change. But the most important thing has to really start with education and, yes. and the, the widest level on the global stage, not just in New York or you know, London and, and, and uh, so on. But just to, to round out the conversation, um, I did ask the question before we, we the impact of ethnicity and diversity uh, is today. And does it have an impact? I mean, can these vo visual voices uh, uh, trigger change in any way, or at least have people open up the door? I mean, it was amazing that Biden actually said uh, to Turkey, there has been a genocide and we are recognizing it. Uh, and Erdogan can say what he wants. There's enough evidence and we all know what the truth is. And what, what I mean, collectively, uh, um, baby steps need to be taken and or do we need to be bolder? I would like to be bolder and, 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 and take initiatives that can create a, a, a wider audience. As I said earlier, you know, the, the 90%, you know, if we ask the, the, uh, on the global stage, what percent of photographers, professional photographers are female versus male? When, when I first started out, and in an association that I belong to, 90% of, uh, 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 of one of the population, 90% were male. And another one, which is about press photography, 3% of the membership were female. Three, and I'm not even going to ethnicity because that would even diminish down to 0 0.40 across. So what's your thoughts, both of you, of, of, of how can we widen that gap? What other things should we be doing as, professionals in, 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 in the universe of photography. I think it's a comp, I think a song said it's, it's, you know, it's a complicated, very, it's a myriad of things. And I think the problem that we're always looking for is this one grand change or one thing that can change everything. And it's going to be a slow process. I mean, look, you know, for example, <sighs> Uh, a, a, a song mentioned, you know, you're talking about ideological sort of filters coming into society. So, you know, education is, is really important and awareness. You know, it, it, I'll give you an example. When you have something, you've got to look at also your, your governments as well and, 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 and institutions and the tone that's coming from there. Like, say, for example, the recent race relations report. Now, it might seem something, okay, well, well, it has a lot to do with everything, because if you say that structural racism doesn't exist, then your institutions don't have to take any responsibility in, in dealing with that, if that's taken on board. That's right. As an official document, right. um, you know, or presented as some, as some kind of a scientific official document, or, or, you know, so the, the, it's, it's, very, it, it's very difficult and complicated. I mean, it's also just about, you know, first of all, talking about let's say just we, let's talk about a, a photography terms just talking about photography history on a wider level away from just the canon group of photographers are always placed now those things are also to do with economics let's say for example galleries if galleries feel that they're going to say commercial gallery are going to make money by selling a certain kind of photographer a certain group of photographers yeah because of that because of economics they're going to do that you know, that, that's something that you have to fight with. You know, you also have a flip side at the moment where you're having an impetus into what is being classed as black photography. What does that mean? As, as Hall says, what is black? What is who defines and what is black culture? Yeah. You know, say, for example, 
example is in the market it's black photography that would be selling is black photographers photographing a certain kind of subject matter well then is that only going to be represented in a commercial market or at festivals if a black photographer isn't is making a certain kind of photography that doesn't fall into that canon and who's controlling yeah that kind of thing so it's about or you know it's a very complicated and very layered process which which is which goes beyond just education it goes to economics and it goes about the sort of worth and 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 commodity so you've got those going those sort of elements going which we must not forget because i have spoken to photographers who are you know black come over and said well hang on a minute we're now getting pigeonholed as well, for only photographers who just photograph black diaspora, black subject matter purely, is only worth being represented or being put out in the place. Now, the argument with that is going, well, those people who so-called say that they're trying to amplify don't actually understand the actual real issue involved. And that is where it goes back to what Song's talking about, having people in those institutions who do reflect that, who do understand that, being involved in the process of amplification or, or, or a conversation. I'm not sure that is really always done. It's done to an extent, but only a certain extent. Yeah. You know, there's only yeah. still a certain group or a certain amount of people who could be allowed in. And I've seen that with, as you've mentioned, you know, just with female photographers, you know. So, uh, you know, I think those things are, are very difficult, but, you know, you still have to make the attempt. You still have to, it's, it's like what Mark C talked about, Ahmet Francis and, and Neil Kenlock, people like that. You know, the, when you look at the imagery, you know, still at the end, they, are, they, they don't reflect, say, black queer culture. You know, it doesn't always show like a strong, you know, the, uh, you know another side of a female culture. But without that, those pictures, you, you would have nothing. So you still have to have a process of, of, of beginning of somewhere. You know, it's also about the archives, opening up the archives. You know, we, I think there's a big, you know, I hear this fear of, oh, people want things taken away. Well, no one's, you know, I'm not, you know, of course, you know, you've got the Gary Winner grand image, which, you know, it, you know, that talks a lot about the canon of photography, you know, one, you know, what we know about with the, the, um, the African-American man holding the chimpanzee, Winner grand's, you know, yeah. and it's on the, you know, that is picked up and, and, and seen as, you know, as, as, as um, articulating a, a particular kind of racism and it was seen as humour. You know, what, what I think is quite interesting with that is someone like Arthur Jaffa looking at the, the latest exhibition by Mapplethorpe, you know, a, a, a black a, American artist taking Mapplethorpe's work and saying, I'm going to curate this and recontextualize it because, you know, he's arguing that, well, hang on a minute, maybe we need to, maybe let's read it a different way. And it's coming from a person who, you know, is saying, let's look at this. So, you know, and I think that's the beauty of people coming in from different sides and different backgrounds. <laughs> I, I think that's, that, that's absolutely right. Looking at in, in the broader uh, landscape and song, this is a question uh, uh, for you. One of the things, you know, when I said that I was unaware of some of the artists that both of you were pre presenting, and I thought I had a pretty core core knowledge. Um, a lot, I think, it, it, it is when something is made public that you can actually see it visually. Right. And in the olden days, when I say olden days, you know, a decade ago, <laughs> that's so old ago. <laughs> uh, you look at who the uh, directors of galleries and museums, the big ones, whether it's MoMA, whether, whether it, it, it's Tate Modern here, and I can uh, list a whole host. Um, there were many male uh, uh, directors, uh, not female directors, uh, white male suited directors. And, um, now, you know, things are opening up more. And nowadays, you know, the major newspapers have commissioning editors that are female, that are not uh, uh, male, and, and, and black, white, orange, and green, and, and, and so on. And, 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 and I guess the question for you, Song, is basically, how do you think the professional universe, you know, like the gallerists and, and like museums, what can they do to assist in this educational process? 
I think that um, they need to really ask themselves some very, very difficult questions mm -hmm. and to answer them honestly. And I, and I don't think that that happens. Um, you know, and it's to your point about, you know, I think that the example that you give of the museums being sort of, you know, suited white men with the, you know, inclusion of some women these days, that also is the photojournalism industry, you know, and I see that a lot as somebody who is in academia when I look at all the photo festivals and the different contests and you know it, it, it is the same 50 people you know and and it's a click and 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 i understand that all professional affiliations have clicks but there is a real gatekeeping mentality to both sets of photographic practice institutions that i think is really problematic um so i think that that's part of it um the second thing, uh, you know, and museums, especially in this country and America are very difficult because they're largely privately funded, right? So now you also have people who are beholden to shareholders of the major corporations who are underwriting the MoMA. So that's a really big problem. But I also think with photographers, we should ask ourselves and as curators who our audiences are and who are we actually making these photographs for? And that's where a lot of phot photographers and I have difficult conversations because Here's what I know as a historian, is that we have been taking photographs of human atrocity and war and cruelty and violence since the birth of photography. Even if we loosely say that's 1840, we have been in this endeavor for 160 years, right? Something I'm curious what that gap is. And, and, I, and I think about Martha Rosler, who's a wonderful photographer and theorist. And, and she talked in, in one of her articles, it's called In, Out, and Around the Documentary Archive. She says that, that often documentary photographs are made for people um, who, to reassure them of their relative comfort and that it is always marginalized people who are being addressed to people who have far more social power than they do. So with all of the social power that has been activated maybe by photography, I'm, I personally as a historian am very curious as to how, how we are still fighting wars and how we are, you know, and because if the idea is that if we see, I, I, it's, it's a very honest question, right? Because the question that's being asked is, well, how do we do better, right? How do we decolonize? Well, we've been looking at the world in a very specific kind of way for a very long time. And it's going to take us a very long time to stop looking at the world through this ideological Western imperialistic gaze. Um, and, you know, again, this is institutional. This, this, is, this is a part of superstructured Karl Marx, right? This has nothing to do with individual instantiations of inequality. This is systemic and that's why it's so dangerous. Um, and so to me, the answer is politics. It's political, it is our leaders, it is running for local office, it is changing things, you know. And then I think all the other fields of representation start to follow. But if, if, if our social structure is enacted in a way and designed in a way to keep people in power, right? Then how are people like us supposed to have grassroots movements when the system is designed to keep those in power in power. Well, the only thing I can say to both of you, because we're going to have to wind up now, is basically uh, born the optimist that I am, that pessimism is not part of my mindset and, and, and so on. And I have witnessed pretty awful atrocities and, and photographed them and told stories. And, and, and sometimes you get lucky and you can trigger something in a positive way. But I think if we stop trying to do it, you know, in the role that you have as an academic and the role that uh, Jermaine and I have is, uh, you know, in your face kind of, photo I wouldn't say in your face, but photography that tries to be honest, to portray what a situation is, uh, some things to make you laugh, other things to make you cry and, and so on. We have to continuously do it. And, and, and the visual uh, uh, documentation, given what the technology is today and how rapid, you know, when we think of the, the George Floyd, how rapid it became a Black Lives Matter on the global stage everywhere, there were demonstrations and so on. 
So, you know, I think there is hope. I think there is light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. No, so I agree. Get yeah. together and, and, and coalesce, you know, as a positive uh, note. I want to thank you both for absolutely the most interesting and fascinating uh, talks. I'm actually going to uh, relive this by watching <laughs> the, uh, the videos. Uh, oh, dear. I <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Jermaine, you and I have a date to uh, go see one, one exhibition once we're released from jail. And Song, when I come to uh, uh, New York, if they let me through customs and everything else, we also have a date and I'm really yes. looking forward to it. Yes, and we yes. no longer have a mask mandate if you're vaccinated. Yes. So it's, it's quite always nice know. here. I yeah. can travel. Anyhow, um, I hope uh, everyone that's uh, joined in tonight, please join us for our next talk, which is Thursday, the 6th of May, just around the corner at uh, 1900 Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, the theme is the DNA of the iconic image, which is going to be really interesting. What makes an image iconic? Is it an image that will last? Does it hold power through the ages? Well, our panelists will uh, be addressing that and showing examples of what they think is iconic beginning with Cornell Watson. He's a North Carolina documentary photographer who created the award-winning series Behind the Mask. Uh, Fiona Shields, who's the commissioning uh, photo editor at the Guardian newspaper, and I correct that, she's the, uh, she's the uh, uh, head of photography at the Guardian. Brandy Estes, who's the head of photography at Sotheby's here in London, and Stu Smith, who's the director and founder of Goss Books, an independent visual arts and photography publisher that specializes in fine art and photojournalistic. Thank you, panel. Thank you, everyone. Pranvira, as always, you just bring it all together. You make everything seamless. And uh, I wish you all have a lovely day and uh, good night, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you Bye. all soon. Ciao.